Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. This episode is the Guns of August Loom. We are going boom, 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 boom. I'm gonna do a play of the lamps are going out. World War One from Compass Games came out in 2016, I believe. Um, designed by Kirk Ullman and developed by Herman Lutman, which, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of. Mr. Lutman's games. So I decided to go ahead and do this one because as you guys know I've been on a World War One run here lately and um, I decided to go ahead and do this one for the anniversary of the beginning of this whole conflict. Um, one thing I will say that's been interesting, some of the books I've been reading lately uh, have really made me rethink a few things. Uh, there's been a couple of books and what I'll do next episode is I'll try to have them here for you um, to show you them, just in case you're interested in this sort of thing, but uh, it's been very interesting reading about the causes of the war, you know, how things played out at the beginning, and um, it's really interesting stuff. Now, some stuff I didn't know before, like, for example, Romania had a military agreement with Germany, if Russia had, you know, attacked Germany first kind of thing, so um, some interesting little tidbit things there come across while doing this, okay? So, this game here, um, right now I'm going to show the spring of 1915 turn, and to that point, so far in the game, the game has been a little um, interesting, but that's part of what I like about this game, spoiler alert, uh, is the, the possibilities, and the possibilities in this game have been really big. So just to give you a brief overview of 1914, what happened. Naturally, the Germans went swinging through Belgium, heading for the Somme. But on the first turn, the Belgian, little Belgian army rolled three. That's right. Uno, dos, tres. Three. They rolled three sixes in a row in combat, which basically is the best number you can get in battle in this game, and completely slowed down the Germans. Hmm, that sounds vaguely familiar. And the Germans could not get any further than where they've gotten to now. They managed to get to the Somme, as you can see down here, uh, where they're at. But uh, it was tough slogging. All right. The other strange thing that happened at the beginning of the game was, over here in the east, uh, one of the event cards that I drew actually allowed the Germans to dig a trench early on. So I put it in Prussia to deal with the Russian steamroller, which, by the way, was also an event card that was drawn, which gives the Russians some extra armies right away at the beginning of the war. And the Russians pressed on Prussia, failed. Then they had a chance to capture uh, Posen here, which would have been a big coup for them. They even had a plus two modifier to the die roll, which, of course, as you all know, die roll modifiers, big deal in wargaming. And they rolled a one and the Germans rolled a six. Bam! Brick wall. Teutonic brick wall. And they failed to capture it. Which was, again, another what kind of moment in this game. So, that's how 1914 is played out. Alright? As I get ready to show you here, 1915. Okay? And again, we'll go through the rules as we go along, just like we always do. Um, warning for those of you who are uh, faint of heart... There is a lot of, I guess you know what they say, there's a lot of luck in this game, there's a lot of randomness that happens, but quite frankly that's part of what I like because this game puts you at the strategic level, puts you in the statesman level, trying to react to what's going on here, circumstances beyond your control kind of thing, um, or law of unintended consequences if you will. So, yeah. So, let's get rolling here and we'll start this turn. If it runs a bit too long, then I'm going to go ahead and, and chop this into two parts. I don't know if it will or won't. If it actually goes pretty quick, then I might go ahead and show you guys um, another turn as well, too, uh, because the books that I mentioned I don't have handy right here in the man cave. I think they're still upstairs because I've been kind of taking notes from them and stuff. So, All right, so here we go. So the turn sequence begins always with Germany. It goes Germany, Western Allies, Eastern Allies, slash U.S. of A, if and when they ever come in, and then the Central 
allies. The central allies, of course, being Austria-Hungary, Turkey, um, eventually, potentially, Bulgaria as well, too. Okay? So, it started in 1915 here. The Germans get to go first. And you have event cards in this game. And you get a set of them to start. And then at the beginning of every spring turn, you add in the year cards for that. So, we're going to go ahead and add in the event cards here that all have the 1915 color on them. Okay, whoops, right there. All right, so we've got a number of those to add in to the deck. Now, most of the decks in this game, I will say, are fairly small. We're talking 10 cards or less. So what I like to do is, because it's kind of hard to shuffle, you know, that small number, I like to do, you know, like what most of us would normally do, you know, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. But then I also count the number of cards, and then I roll a die to give extra randomness, just in case, you know, my brain is... You know, kind of working at a separate level, going, oh, I know where that card went. Oh, I think it's the fourth one. All right, uh, that kind of thing. So let's see. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards. So I'll go ahead and select an eight-sided die. And let's see which card we'll get some event card to get this rolling. Of course I rolled an eight. <clears throat> let's try again. Too high. So we'll roll a separate one, second one. And this time I rolled a three. So let's see what event card we get. One, two, three. One of those traits. No substitutions, exchanges, or refunds. All right. So to start this turn off, the Germans are going to get the East Asia Squadron. Ah, okay. So we're going to place it near the British Isles. Now during the combat phase, the Western Allies, WA, can remove it, use a British fleet, and die roll three or higher. Uh, however... If it's still on in the production phase, um, it can reduce Great Britain's production points. Awesome! So we'll go ahead and let's find the East Asia squadron marker and stick it off old jolly England. Oh, I forgot to tell you, that was the other big thing that happened. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to show you any naval combat because um, uh, up here, Germany began the game with two high seas fleet. Um, the British begin with three, and combat, just to give you a quick rundown here. When you do naval combat, you roll die for each unit. One hit gets you one hit, two hits get you two hits, and a three through six gets you a zippo. Well, the Germans rolled a three and a six. The British rolled two twos and a one for five hits, completely destroyed the German fleet. So it was like, holy cows. Okay. One other thing I like to do for solo play is to kind of remind things. I like to stick a die down to help me remember whenever things are in play. So that way I'll remember about this East Asia squadron. And I'll do the same thing down here at the bottom of the board. I'll put a blue die on it to remind me it is in play. Okay, so not a bad event card to start. Okay, so we rebuilt the deck, which you only have to do in spring turns. You add in the new year cards, plus whatever old cards you still have. So at the beginning of the game, everybody has three cards for 1914. You're going to use two of them. You'll take that one, add it to the 1915 cards, which is, of course, what I just did. Okay. Now, movement phase. You can move armies and artillery. Now, in the game, basically, let me zoom in on Austria-Hungary here, because they've got both units so far. They're the only ones, thanks to the Skoda works. Basically, every unit in the game is an army. Okay, So this, again, is at a very grand strategy level. Artillery is the heavy artillery that you can use um, in the game as well. To move, you can move an unlimited number of spaces across territory that you own, but you can only move two army slash artillery per turn. Now, of course, the British, with their naval capability, they're able to transport people across the sea, which counts as a move too, um, but they're the only ones that's really able to do that. Nobody else is able to do those sorts of things. Okay, so now Germany can move two armies if they want. Now I'm trying to decide what to do here because, of course, looking over here in the west, dun, 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 I've got a lot of pressure against Paris, and so far no one's been able to dig trenches. So this is my last great chance to try and slam in and capture Paris. If I can hold on to Paris until the end of the Western Ally activity uh, or to turn. 
I can win the game. That's one of the quick automatic wins in the game. The problem is over here, I do have the Russians causing some problems. But at the end of last turn, at the end of the winter, 1914 turn, the Austro-Hungarians launched some seriously successful attacks and took the pressure off by slamming uh, the Russians in Poland and also in Ukraine, uh, so weakening them. Okay, spent armies, there's two states armies can be in, either spent or fresh. If you're spent, you can't attack. So basically, it took the teeth out of the bear in Poland. Okay, So I could move some of these armies around. I don't have too many armies in the game. I spent a lot of time refitting them. More about that here towards the end of the turn. But I do have a couple down here in the Rhine, which I also have a trench down here too, which makes combat, of course, more difficult, naturally enough. So the question is, do I want to transfer troops to the Eastern Front, or do I want to go ahead and transfer one more up into the Somme and try to press Paris? Ah, that's a good question. Hmm. Let's see. Well, if I lose Prussia, Prussia's not a big deal. Um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Yunkers wouldn't see it that way, but, you know. Um, so let's go ahead and, because I think I can threaten Paris... And thereby get the French to pull out this one unit here. I'll go ahead and move these guys all the way through here. Now, Belgium, I don't have any troops in, although it is conquered. Because basically, so long as the Germans have a fleet in existence or if they have any fresh U-boats, which I've got two of them up here, um, and the unrestricted submarine warfare box. That's right, I went whole hog right off the bat. I mean, look, you're either, you know, you're either in or you're not. I mean, you know, psst, let's do this. So, so long as that happens, the Western Allies cannot launch any kind of amphibious invasion against Belgium. So, I'm not really worried about that. Okay? Alright, so I've moved everybody. Now, there's some other things I can do here. Move fleets, move U-boats, but I'm not going to do that. And now we got the combat phase. Now, naval combat, well, Germany doesn't have any fleets. Pfft, takes care of that. Guerrilla combat. Now, guerrilla combat. There is down here... Let me move you guys a little bit here, just to show you. Down here in the side, and I guess I'm going to move you a little more. There is the East Africa box, okay? And down here, there is a German army, which, of course, is blocking the British army. And it can either attack normally, or they can use guerrilla tactics if they want. Which, of course, not as much chance of success, but much safer, because you won't get your army spent. And basically, there's no way for the Germans to refresh that army. It's basically impossible, except through an event card. So, I'm going to go ahead and do a guerrilla attack. Now, if the army is fresh, like it is here, I need a 5 or a 6 to be successful. If it's spent, I need a 6. So, let's see what I got. Survey says... Ho! Hot dog. Okay? I got a 5. Now, notice combat happens between adjacent spaces, so you don't actually move into the space for combat unless you force the enemy to retreat. Now... That one hit will take down the British. This guy won't get spent, but you basically only can only attack once with an army um, each turn. Well, more about that here in a second when we try to capture Paris um, in a moment. But that'll slow the British down in East Africa, which if the game goes the whole nine yards all the way down to the fall of 1918, that can be important in terms of victory points. Okay, let's head back north here, back across the Mediterranean. Uh, well, across Africa, and then to the Mediterranean, and then we'll go up here to where the Germans are pressing on Petty. Alright, so, when you launch an attack, you can attack uh, with as many armies as you want against the space. You could even attack, like, say, five times here, and then I could switch all the way over to Prussia if I wanted, and try to smack the bear a little bit harder, tweak his nose if I wanted. Um, and you can come back. You can do that. So there's no set order on things. The only limit really is um, what you have adjacent to enemy territory, and then so long as you have fresh armies. Fresh armies are the key. All right, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and start by attacking with a fresh German army. We'll have a fresh French army. Try to block them. Here we go. All right, and combat in this game, guys, is really, really simple. Okay, high roll wins, all right? So in this particular, whoops, wrong way, I wanted to bring you in some more. In this particular case, the Germans rolled the five, the French rolled the three. Now, if a tax is successful, 
the defending army is spent, and the attacking army will be always spent unless they're trying to breach trenches. That's the only time an attacking army would stay fresh. Um, more about that maybe later if I do a summer 1915 turn, which I might, and just to show you guys how trench combat works and stuff. Or maybe I'll have the Russians bang their head on Prussia just to demonstrate here um, a little bit later on. So now I'll go again. The Germans, fresh army. French, fresh army. And once again, the Germans are the high one. Four to three. So once again, the French, who of course don't have anywhere near the production ability that the Germans do, they take another hit and get knocked down. I will just keep going. Here you come again. Whoops. That's something else. Oh. Finally. Oh. Shoot. I already forgot one of the big rules. Always. Ah, I always. I will say this. If you're playing this by yourself, find a way to remember this. I already. I, I always forget this rule. This is like the third or fourth time I play. And I don't know why I always forget. Maybe because I'm not as well versed in World War One as I am in some other topics. Uh, maybe it's it's just it's some kind of brain block. I don't know. But what I should have done after that first successful attack is I should have put the counter out here that here we'll give you an extreme close-up. The big push. So when you're successful against an enemy unit, not a trench, then you get this big push marker. And basically you get plus one to your die roll every single time until you lose. Okay? So, I should have had that marker on the map. And now this would actually be a tie. Now, typically, ties will go to the attacker. Okay? Unless, and the Western Allies do have this, unless you have air superiority. Then you can use your air superiority, which you get through technology, which we'll talk about here a little bit later, to win the first tied combat. Now, if the battle is tied, the defending army stays fresh, they're cool, and the attacking army becomes spent. And now the plus one, big push marker, goes away. So you have to earn it back. Now the other thing about the big push marker is that if you attack from one space, let's say we were attacking from the Somme, like we are now, and then let's say that the Germans own Verdun, and if you attack from another space, then you take away the marker. So in other words, in order to maintain the plus one big push, which is like pushing through the enemy lines or especially later breaching the trench system, uh, you have to keep attacking from that space. Okay, it's the only way to keep that modifier there. Okay, so Germany's not going to let one little setback. Ah, uh, uh, another loss. All right, so that reduces again. But again, the Germans can keep going. They've still got, oh, what I got there, at least three fresh armies. So let's keep pushing. Try to wear down the enemy. Ah, there we go. Two to one. So the French army will become spent. The German army becomes spent. And now we'll get that big push marker back and put it on that space for the Germans making a big push against the French and well there's British troops there too it might be a little hard to see them but they're there as well all right let's keep going we got two more armies I'm gonna wear them down five and five but of course with the plus one for the big push turns into a six so once again French army German army both exhausted but again, the Germans are going to continue to press because the one thing the Germans have more of than the French is productivity. How much more? Well, let's put it this way. The... Whoa, what happened? We lost our focus. I'm not sure why. Hmm. There we go. We're back. Sorry about that. Um, I haven't had that happen before. That was weird. Production. Production. The French only get four production points per turn. The Germans get 12. So, um, yeah. All right, once more, it's feeling, but not this time, okay? This time, the French are the higher one. The Germans have completely shot their wad. We lose the big push marker. 
And now basically the battle is over because there are no more fresh German troops to attack. Okay? All right. And again, this is very much a grand strategy game. This is a game that lets you focus on the big picture, the big strategy. Okay? You don't have to spend time, you know, dealing with procedures and, and 800,000 rules, you know, to get to where you're going. This game focuses on the big picture. Now, if I wanted to, I could still attack with something else. And since I can refit my units at the end, I mean, I could go ahead and get them supplies. I could go ahead and hold on to that and build some more armies. That's up to me. I can also send money to my friends if I want. I think what we'll do for this turn is we're going to go ahead and we're going to call it quits for combat this time, which we've had a pretty decent combat. We wore down quite a few French armies. We got a good smack on the British in East Africa. But on the Eastern Front, things are still a little dicey, despite our Austro-Hungarian allies doing a pretty good job, actually, on the first turn. So we'll go ahead and end combat there. All right, now, when combat's done, then you go on to the production phase. Okay, Every country has production chart telling you how many points they get and then all the locations in their country. Now, if an enemy conquers a production space, unlike other games, you, the conqueror, do not get any benefit from it. What you do is deny your opponent that point. So, for example, right now, Germany is in the Somme. The Somme is worth one production point to the French, so the French actually only have three production points right now, but the Germans are still at 12. Okay. The only exception to that I've seen in the entire rules is the first turn. If the Germans conquer Belgium on the first turn, they actually get one bonus production point. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the logic is behind that, but I haven't read the designer's notes, in all fairness. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so that's there. Okay, so i got my production points here. All right, so let's go through the steps. Check the blockade box. Well, not much to check there because... I'm not going to get anything out of that because the British basically, uh, they have the blockade there. Um, they're keeping the screws on Germany. Okay, So I don't really need to worry about uh, um, that. It's only if the Germans actually have control of the blockade box. That gets them some points and takes away from the British. That's the surface raiders, how the surface raiders are represented in this game. Okay. Alright, uh, events. I don't have any production events. Like, for example, what I told you before that turn um, with the Russians, where the steamroller in the production phase, they got to put two Russian armies spent on the map free of cost. So, you might have event cards like that. Alright, U-boat attrition. Now, I do have two U-boats. That's the only counters the Germans get in the game for U-boats. I have to check and see how are my U-boats doing. Alright, so you roll two dice. And then you're going to take a look at the attrition chart. So my first U-boat, I rolled an 8. Second U-boat, oh, box cars, a 12. So let's see what kind of situation I've got there. And I will say, things are pretty well organized in this. Um, you can pick up on things pretty quick. Uh, this isn't a hard game to learn. It's actually pretty easy. And as you can see from the number of counters, there are on the map compared to some other World War game, World War One games, thinking like Guns of August kind of sort of thing here. Uh, there's not much to do here. So let's look at the U-boat attrition chart. All right, our first roll was an eight. Spent if Q2 act technology is active. Well, the British don't have that yet. Twelve, no effect. The U-boat remains fresh. Booyah! So that means both of my gray wolves will be hunting the British. More about that when it's the Western Allies' turn. Okay, receive transferred production. Now, if you send production points to friends, this is where you basically it shows up and you get to add it to your production point total. Germany is not in a position to ever receive any because, of course, they're the big dog of the Central Powers. All right, now, production spending. So you can do a couple different things here, but you must do them strictly in order. Uh, that's a big thing here, so you need to be careful uh, and think about your budget here, okay? Because you can refit units. We're about to do that here in a second. You can raise new ones. You can construct trenches, which I can do. Now it is 1915. And then you can also transfer production, send points to your friends. So I'll start by refitting units. 
Refeeding units cost one production point a piece. So naturally I'm going over here to the SOM and I'm going to refit everybody. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of my 12 production points are refitting troops there. All right, so that means I have four points left. Uh, I'm tempted to raise two armies and prepare to deal with some things in the east. But I could also build a trench as well, too. Now, for the Germans, it's cheaper to build a trench than anybody else. So I could build one army. That's two points. Then I could dig a trench system, build a trench system. That's another point. And then I could send a point to my friends, Austria. Let's do that. All right, so I'll build a new army. And new armies can be placed in any home space. Okay, you can't place them in... Conquer spaces. So, for example, I can't put it in the Somme. I can't even put it in Belgium. So, I'll put it over here in Posen. Um, well, actually, you know what? Well, yeah, the Russians won't be able to refresh their armies until the end of the turn. So, they could try to attack Prussia, but I do have trenches there. You know what? We'll leave it where I put it in Posen. Okay? Then I'll take a trench marker. Each side has only so many trench markers in the entire game. So you have to be careful how you use them. And I'll dig it over here in the psalm. That's three points. And then I will take one of these transfer markers that look like this. And I'll send this one point down to Vienna. Vienna calling. Oh, ho, ho. And then my friends, the Austro-Hungarians, who of course are um, not exactly the strongest knife in the drawer, shall we say. Uh, they'll be able to have a little more help when it comes time for them to build things. Okay, all right, so we've done all that. Now we deal with technology. Now technology in this game is represented by the technology cards. Each side starts with 10, okay? Now again, to help with randomization, I shuffled them, but now I'm gonna roll this 10-sided die and see which card I get. Survey says seven. Now the question is, is it lucky seven or not? Seven. Let's see. Survey says... Be oh, I swear. No kidding. This is the third freaking time in a row I pulled this card. I have shuffled this deck. I have rolled dice. And this is the third time I get it. Now, why am I so frustrated? Well, each card has a letter and a number. In order to get technology, you have to start at the beginning. P1. Okay? Like the Western Allies have down here... On this card, they have P1 on their arrow reconnaissance card. Well, this one's P3, which means I can't use it. I have to have P1 first. I swear, I kid you not, this is the third time in a row. Three returns, three times I pulled this sucker. I am apparently, I don't know what happened to German technology. That must be, I, uh, 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 well, you know what? I'm just going to quote the Beastie Boys. Sabotage! Because that seems to be what has happened here. So I'm going to shuffle these right here in front of all of you so you can see I'm mixing them up trying hard to mix them up holy spaghetti that's just BSC what? yeah BSC that's right the first word's bat the last one's crazy and I think y'all can guess the middle one alright so I shuffled them great we'll see how that turns out in the summer of 1915 alright so um, that was my researching technology. You can also get to draw bonus technology cards. That comes as a result of event cards. Discard G1 tech. Now G1 tech, the Western Allies have it, is poison gas. Um, we'll talk about that here in a minute when we do the Western Allies turn. Next. All right. Last thing you do is determine air superiority. Well, the Germans have no planes, so that's not really an issue right now. And reset heavy artillery. So if you had any heavy artillery, you'd flip it back to its fresh side. Okay? All right, so let's move on now in the spring of 1915 to the Western Allies. So again, the Western Allies will take their 1915 cards. All five of them. Add them to the card that's left. Which at the beginning of the game, of course, it's not too hard to figure out what's left once you start to play the game a little bit. Because you only start with three. So once you draw it and you're like, oh, okay, I have, must be this one added to the 1915 cards. But as the game goes on and you have some more cards left, 
becomes a little harder. So you don't want to look at the cards that are still face down that you didn't use for whatever year it is. You want to put them in and shuffle them so you don't know what's going on. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, they have six. So let's roll a six-sided die. Let's see what we get. We rolled a three, two, three. So what's behind door number three for the Western Allies? It is Treaty of London. Okay, if Italy is neutral, Italy declares war and joins the Triple Entente. They receive one extra production point during this turn's production phase. Well, that's pretty good for the Western Allies to get them in right away. So to remind me about the production point, I'll go ahead and put this in Roma. Okay, so let's bring Italy into the game. Let's look at how they're set up, what they get. They only get one production point per turn. Okay, they do have five armies they can build, and they also will start with two armies in northern Italy, which is exactly where the production is. That's the only production space, but they're both spent, so they won't be able to do anything on the opening turn. Now, this, of course, is bad for Austria-Hungary because they were putting a lot of pressure on Russia, and now they're going to have to deal with the Italians, which can be a big deal. Now, of course, in the real Great War, um, you know, the Italians and the, and the Austro-Hungarians just bang their heads in the Alps repeatedly. But I actually had a game, I'm not sure of the last game of the game before, where um, the British sent help to the Italians and they drove all the way up into Bavaria. So, yeah. <laughs> so, again, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do with this game. Um, you don't have to necessarily follow the historical narrative the whole way through and true. I mean, you can. It can't happen that way. But it have to. Okay. Right? All right, so big to do there for the Western Allies. The Italians have joined the war. And if I remember correctly, that was May the 23rd, 1915. I think it was May 23rd. Maybe it was 22nd. I'll have to look it up. Okay, so we're done with our event card. Okay, now movement. All right, movement wise. Now, what I could do if I wanted, I could move two armies. I could move this army in Britain and send it down to any port space here in Italy. So I could send it down and help them reinforce and again, give them some support. But I am wondering right now, uh, I'm worried about the French because the French have got to stay, uh, they have to stay in the game, so to speak. So I need to hang on to Paris. So what I'm gonna do for one movement, because remember you can move two armies and or artillery. I'm gonna sail these guys across the English Channel, land them here, jolly good. And just hang on. Um, I don't think I'll move anybody else yet this turn. I think we'll leave this be as is. That's that old Sesame Street. I think it was Sesame Street. Might have been the electric company. Um, little skit said about a used car that was for sale. The guy kept asking questions, and the guy, the guy's like, the guy's selling us like as is. <laughs> so, all right. So I think that'll be it for this particular deal here for the British and the Western Allies, which of course now involves Italy. All right, now combat, naval combat. Well, there's nobody in the blockade box, don't have to worry about that. Amphibious invasions, um, unlike the real British, I've never been anxious to try Gallipoli, but maybe I'll have to. We'll see, see what the Turks can do. I had a game um, once where the Turks got all the way up almost to Kiev, so, you know, they, they theoretically can, you know, sweep up through, through the Caucasus, which again is something that you know, didn't happen, but, you know, could have happened. You never know. Lots of things can happen. And, or as I like to say, as you guys know, anything can happen, and it often does. All right. So, now we're down to ground and beachhead combat. Okay, well, I don't have any beachheads, so that kind of takes care of that. What I do have, though, is the poison gas card. Now, poison gas, I mentioned this before, gives you a plus one die roll modifier, but here's the thing. At the end of the turn, when I do technology, after I draw my tech card for the West, I have to discard this, whether I use it or not. So I probably do want to try to use it at least once um, this turn. Basically, discarding the poison gas card, according to uh, the notes in the rule book, is simulating the investigation and continued exploration of trying to find a stronger, more lethal uh, poison gas uh, to try and break the stalemate, if you will, in the West. So... Um, so I probably want to do that at some point. I also have the East Asia Squadron to deal with, though, too, remember, from the German event card. 
So actually the combat phase I do have naval I want to do. So I can remove it by spending one British fleet and rolling a three or higher. So let's do that because I mean we can do it because the Germans have nothing. <laughs> the Germans, that's the most lopsided naval combat I've seen. So here we go. Fleet number one. Well I took care of that. So no sweat. So it was a three. So we spend this fleet. It's now exhausted. This East Asia squadron is now removed from the map, which of course means then we'll remove the German event card from the map as well, too. Because now, of course, it won't affect the production phase for the Western Allies. And now we can do some ground combat if we want. And I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'll go ahead and use my poison gas card. And I'll have one French army here. And this is going to be a chance also to show how the trench combat works, too. So let's go back up to the Somme, because, of course, that's where all this is going to happen. So let me slide you guys over a little bit. So back up to the Somme we go. All right, now, you can see the German trench there at the top. All right, so when there is an enemy trench, you have to attack that trench first. You can have up to two trenches in a space, but you cannot build two trenches in a space at one time. So, for example, like that last production phase, I had enough production points as the Germans, but I cannot build two trenches in the same space on the same turn. Now, next time Germany's turn comes up, if I want to add a second trench to the Somme, I can do that, but you can't do it right off the bat. All right. So we'll go ahead and we'll have this French army here attack. They'll get plus one from the poison gas. Let's see if they're successful. Okay, well, rolled threes. Now, with the plus one for the poison gas, that turns into a four. Now, if the attack is successful, the trenches get flipped. There's basically a breach. And the attacking army, which was this one down here, it stays fresh, okay? And now I could go ahead and attack if I want, but no big push marker, okay? Not whenever you're breaching the trench. So now, of course, the French, I could continue to attack. I could wear down the Germans, try to, to stick it to them here, but I don't have the big push available. Um, so I could do that. I, I could go ahead and, and deal them some damage if I wanted. But I kind of did that mostly because, you know, the poison gas card is use it or lose it. And I also wanted to show how the trench thing worked, too. But right now, I don't think it's in the French best interest to do this. Quite frankly, I've found, so far anyway, in my solo playing, strategically, it makes more sense if the French can hang on in the West and for the British actually do what I just mentioned a little bit ago, send an army down to Italy. So, so we'll go ahead and we'll do that. Now, at the end of combat, if you don't force the defenders out of the space, that trench marker gets turned back over. But again... No harm, no foul here, because the victorious army, the victorious French army here, does not have to be spent after the combat. Okay? All right. So, I think it's all the combat we're going to do for right now with the, uh, with the British. I think we'll, we'll, in the Western Allies, we'll, uh, we'll stick with that for now. Okay. All right, so now we're down to the production here. Production phase. Check the blockade box. Well, blockade box, fine. Just the British there. Events. We don't have any event because, of course, we got rid of that one. U-boat attack. So now there's two fresh U-boats. So now the British will have to see what impact do those U-boats have. So let's see. Alright. So we'll put them up here by the British shops. We rolled an 11. And a six. So let's see. Let's check the chart. Ready? Here we go. All right. Eleven. This one goes to eleven. Unsuccessful. Dun, dun, dun. Too bad for the Germans. The six. Ah, it's a success no matter what. Now some of these, again, depends on the technology level. Convoys active, unrestricted warfare, those kind of things. Okay. So the British will lose one production point this turn. I'll drop them from 7 to 6. And again, I'll put this up here in the British Isles. And I'll put this blue die, because it's visually easy to see, to remind me that the British will lose their production point. Okay? 
All right, to receive transfers, well, what I like to do is just leave the markers on the board until I actually spend them for that country, okay? Now, spending goes in a group like this, because, of course, Germany didn't have a group. You start with the country with the lowest production points and work your way up. In this case, it would be Italy. Now, Italy gets one, plus they got that bonus one, remember, from the event card, okay? So that gives them two. So clearly, the Italians will just refit these two guys. They got nothing else to do. So that's pretty easy for them. Now the French. Well, the French lost the Somme, so that dragged them down to three. The British sent them two points. That takes them up to five. So the first thing I want to do for sure with those five points is refit these armies. So one, two, three, four. So that's four. But I got one point left. Now you can't save them. And I can't use one point for a trench. Western allies require two production points to build a trench. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one and send this production point to Italy. Okay, You can send it to countries that have less than you do. So that's what I'll do. I'll try to help the Italians maybe build another army and we'll see if we can get a second front, so to speak, going here um, against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. All right. Now you can send up to four production points per turn to countries that uh, have less production value than you. The British and the Germans never can receive any points, um, and neither can the U.S. When, if and when the U.S. comes into the game. Okay, so that's the French. Now, the British lost one point, so they have six points altogether. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to spend one point to refit here because I don't want to lose East Africa. Okay, so that's one point there. So that now takes me down to five. Okay, well, we don't have a whole lot of other things here. So of those five points, I'm going to take two and build a British army, which I'm going to send to Italy here in the summer of 1915. So that's two more points. That's three of my five points I've spent now. So I've got, or sorry, three of my, my six points I have. So I'm going to spend another two points and dig a trench in Paris, which takes me down to one point now. And now with that last point, I can do a couple of things. I can either send it to Italy, or I could even send it all the way to the Serbians. Okay. Now, when you're transferring points, with Italy it's fairly easy because there's an open space there. However, if you're transferring points to other places, you can go through a neutral country, but it actually costs you an extra production point. So in this case, since I only have one production point left, I actually couldn't send it to Serbia. It would cost me two to do that. Okay. So you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send that extra production point down to Italy. And I'll have the Italians help me out here. I could send it to the Russians, but um, that's okay. They just, I mean, they're doing okay on their own. They don't need our help right now. We need to we need to get that Italian front rolling because in past games that Italian front has been been very very helpful in putting pressure on the central power. I almost called them the Axis. I'm so used to World War II. Okay. Now technology. Okay. Once again, we need an eight-sided die here because there's ten cards and there's two cards out. So the die roll is a five. So let's see what the technology card says this time. One, two, three, four, five. So behind door number five we have, oh, boy the Western Allies are getting lucky. So they get counter battery fire right off the bat. Okay, Western Allies get one heavy artillery unit, any area containing one supplied French or British one, and the Eastern Allies, U.S. also gets one. Whew. Too bad that British Army wasn't already in Italy because I could have put it with them, but since they're not there yet, I can't do it. Um, that's unfortunate. So, But this is big because, again, this is level one, which I was saying about before. Okay, So, they'll get a heavy artillery unit, which, of course, naturally I'll put over here in Perry. And the Russians will also get a heavy artillery unit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it up here in Lithuania to try and bash my way into Prussia. Okay, So that actually worked well for them. Now, the gas card, no matter what, goes back into the tech deck. Let me shuffle the, 
the tech deck here. Dun 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 dun. All right. And again, you know, I just do the die roll to add extra randomness to it. Again, some people don't like that. You know, right now the Western Allies have a huge lead in tech. Okay. Um. So yeah, it's kind of ridiculous, but. You know, again, I mean, you know, to me it doesn't bother me because it's difficult to say. You know, how would things have played out? Do we know for sure? You know, I mean, look at the Germans working on their atomic bomb in World War II. If that one scientist either um, deliberately or accidentally, uh, as far as I know that's still ambiguous, had not moved them away from graphite as a stabilizer, you know, holy smoke. But they did. And that's what happened. So, I mean, you know, it didn't have to happen that way. What it did. All right, so that's the tech. We researched our tech. We discarded our tech. Air superiority. Now, if the Germans had planes too, then we would do some dogfighting. But the Germans have nothing, as we know, because I keep getting that P3 when I don't even have a P1. Okay? So, they'll be able to put their plane wherever they want, basically, well, within reason, of course. You have to put it with a space that has either British or French troops. And, of course, I'll put it back in Paris, because right now we're trying to defend Paris as we try to prepare for a counterattack against the Germans. So I'll put it there. There's no heavy artillery. And we're on to the Eastern Allies. Okay, so same thing. We'll add their 1915 cards to the deck of event cards here, and we'll see which one they get. So let's see, here's all our 1915 cards, which of course, as you can imagine, also contains some cards concerning the United States, because remember, it's Eastern Allies and the United States, so it's both, okay? So we'll take those new event cards, shuffle them in with the other event cards, Whoops. Ah, sorry about that one event card, I guess, doesn't want to play. It took off. It fell on the floor. Mm, it's terrible when your game components don't want to play with it, you know. <laughs> Alright, so we got one, two, three, four. We got five of them here. So I'll roll ten-sided die. And of course, you know, one through five and then repeat. Alright. So... Five, six, seven, eight. Shamil. Shamil. Oh, okay. Now, the event card is. <gasps> Dun. I'm going to stop here because I know we've been at this for a while. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this into two parts. And I will do the Eastern Allies slash Russia. And I will do um, the Central Allies as a second video. Just to show you an entire turn in the game. And also to show you those books too um, next time, just in case you're interested. You know, because one of the things I've always found over the years, although it's easier now with the internet, when I was younger it was, it was much harder to do. But one of the things that um, is hardest to find good books on topics. So I have a couple World War One books I'll share with you that I've read that I've enjoyed recently. Um, just to share with the next video I'll share them with you because again most of them are, are not here. Uh, right now. Um, I have to kind of collect them up because again I have them on making notes and things. Well for a variety of reasons. Some things are just things I want to try and then other things are um, you know I'm interested in decision making theory. I think I mentioned to you guys before. So you know we'll see. Okay. So what is underneath that event card? Could it be something unless the Russians roll into Prussia? Can the Russians hold the Austro-Hungarians at bay? And what about the new Turkish armies? Tune in next time. Same bare bones channel. Same bare bones time. <laughs> For those of you either old enough to remember, or like me, grew up watching those repeats of that campy Batman show with um, uh, Adam West and Burt Ward. You know the joke I'm dealing with here. If you don't know, check it out. This can't, it just can't be fun. It's just silly, to be honest. Although it had some really good actors in that show. Burgess Meredith played the Penguin. And for my money, Burgess Meredith was an excellent actor. But that's just my personal opinion. I could be wrong.
All right, so next time we'll find out what's underneath that event card and we'll see what the rations will do. And we'll see if the Yanks get any closer to coming in the game as well. Get to see if we get any closer to singing over there, over there, over there, over there. We'll see. So until next time, as we move through the second half of the spring of 1915, this is Tim Korchner from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching and I'll catch you again next time.